walk up to the mic and wait until one of our panelists um, let you know that you could ask your question. Uh, the only thing I ask of you, please, uh, is to keep your questions short since we are on a tight uh, schedule. And this way we can give a chance for everyone else to ask uh, whichever you please. With that, I'd like to introduce to the stage and welcome. It's an honor and pleasure to welcome Minister Levine. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, warm welcome and uh, you know that's like uh, being behind a barrier you know to uh, to put my notes uh, down there but uh, no it's uh, it's great to be here and uh, I believe this is my fourth or fifth event associated with mental health in the last uh, two two and a half weeks and uh, and so uh, this is an area as a Minister of Health, Wellness and Seniors that uh, uh, I will be very much engaged in during my uh, time in office. Uh, coming out of the uh, education system as a teacher and school administrator, uh, team mental health and the directions that we need to go, uh, you know, uh, are uh, beckoning for the kind of professional and just people attention that, uh, that it requires uh, along uh, with I think some very very uh, exciting directions that uh, together uh, we can uh, embark on. So, uh, so just a, a few uh, notes that, uh, that I've made here and uh, I guess I'm going to be introducing the panel uh, as well. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the event, uh, Intersections of Art, Mental Health and Recovery. And I'd like to thank uh, TeenMentalHealth.org and the IWK, and we have with us today uh, the CEO of the IWK, uh, Anne McGuire. And uh, Anne started her career as a mental health uh, a nurse, uh, spent time in the Valley, and uh, during her 10 years at the IWK, uh, she has made uh, improving mental health programs and of course uh, now replacing Four South is the fabulous world-class um, uh, now on the fifth floor uh, and just had an opening uh, which is now known as the Garan uh, Center and uh, if you get an opportunity I'm sure a staff member would be willing to uh, host you and show you what we in this province and for Atlantic Canada can be extremely proud of. It really is uh, world class. We all know that art, and that's what uh, some of the focus today and a big part of the focus will be, uh, challenge us to think in new and different ways. Creating art allows us to express ourselves in a creative and holistic way. It offers hope and an outlet 
for, for those who need it. In a few minutes, I will introduce you to an impressive panel of experts who will explore the intersection of art, mental health, and recovery in relation to youth in Nova Scotia. Mental illness is something that touches so many of us from all walks of life and from every part of our province. It's so important that we continue to talk about this important issue, to bring it out into the open so that people who are struggling know they are not alone. People like Clara Hughes, who recently stopped in Nova Scotia as part of our national bike tour to raise awareness and reduce stigma around mental health, are doing such great work in this area. We all know one of the big statistics we hear uh, a lot, those who are uh, focused on mental health issues, one in five of us will experience mental health issues at some point during our lifetimes and uh, to have the ability uh, to talk about it, uh, to bring it out into the open, uh, to see it as part of that creating a wellness in our community is a, is a real call for all of us uh, to certainly to, to act upon. So uh, that really translates into about 200,000 Nova Scotians and the numbers raise cons uh, significant concern for our youth especially considering uh, one of these statistics I know I've heard Dr. Stan Kutcher uh, echo many times and that is about 70 percent of all those mental health issues, conditions uh, can in fact uh, be first picked up uh, while our teens are in the school system. So with support and treatment many people living with mental illnesses are able to continue on with their normal activities, going to work, raising a family, enjoying friendships. As government, we, we know that we have work to do and that there is no overnight solution to improving mental health services in this province. But we are making progress. We know that peer support is a key part of helping people living with mental illness. And we're proud that Nova Scotia is the first province in the country to have a certified peer support specialist program. And it was an absolute delight to uh, be involved with opening that conference, which attracted people from all over Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand. So we do break ground in this area uh, in, in terms of an array of programs and people uh, to support them uh, here in our province. Peer support offers hope, increases resiliency, and helps people with mental illness set their own course for recovery. At a broader level, our mental health addiction strategy, Together We Can, is a long-term plan for improving access to services and programs. And uh, just a couple of highlights uh, of the strategy. We've introduced more mental health clinicians in schools across the province expanded the Strongest Families program to all Nova Scotia, and also we've expanded the crisis line. It's a pretty sensitive little mic. Uh, if you don't have it close, you're in trouble. Uh, and we've also, in, in parts of the province in particular, and as I did a tour of the province through January, February, and part of March, uh, I was also informed uh, that wait times in some parts of our province for mental health services have, re have made really dramatic improvement. And uh, that is truly a, good, uh, a very, very good thing because we know uh, time-sensitive uh, response is, is very, very important. Uh, we've increased the number of gay straight alliances in school, uh, supported municipalities in reducing alcohol harms across the province, and, uh, since becoming minister, I've attended uh, three of those and uh, just uh, overwhelmingly impressed with the kind of response when you get a uh, hundred concerned residents that have come together in three of the locations where I've been. Uh, it really uh, signals, I think, a, a new day uh, for us to take a look at, uh, again, you know, the responsible drinking issue and how we all need to be part uh, of resolving that. So the work continues. 
Government is committed to improving access to mental health services in Nova Scotia and helping the many people who need care. But we are by no means the only ones working hard to support those living with mental illness, their families, and their care providers. Medical and academic institutions and nonprofit organizations are all represented on today's panel of experts. So it is that time uh, to, uh, to introduce, and uh, leading today's discussion will be Dr. Stan Kucher, and he's obviously uh, no stranger in, in our province, uh, and especially uh, to adolescent uh, mental, uh, mental health. Uh, in fact, he's the chair of, uh, of Adolescent Mental Health and TeenMentalHealth.org, an internationally renowned expert in adolescent mental health, national and international leader in research, advocacy, training, and policy, and he's current director of the World Health Organization uh, Collaborating Center. Did I say enough, Stan? Is that, uh, is that uh... My mother's not here, it's okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave out then a, a few of those other very strong credentials that uh, Stan uh, does uh, come with us. And again, no, no stranger to uh, uh, those of us who have to tune into the media. That's part of, uh, part of uh, my life, I know, and that's uh, Star Dobson. And uh, she's the president and CEO of the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. Obviously, a very familiar face from uh, uh, Live at Five on CTV News, and instrumental in supporting the arts in uh, health care. And uh, it, it was wonderful to uh, see Stir, uh, you know, uh, change uh, careers uh, by picking up this phenomenal, important cause. And uh, it is a departure uh, career wise uh, for her. Uh, we could say she was very, very comfortable in front of the camera, but to have her now working in this direction, uh, I think will be a marvelous asset uh, for all of us in the province uh, and beyond. And we have Dr. John Graham Pohl, that is just here to my right, Professor Emeritus of uh, Pediatrics, Oncology, and Palliative Care at the University of Florida, co-founder of the Center for Arts and Health Research and Education, he received the 2012 Outstanding Leadership Award from the Global Alliance for Arts in Health, a founding member of Arts Health Andy Ganesh. Gosh, where's the x ray? As soon as we talk about Andy Ganesh. Uh, a published author and editor, and he serves on the Art Health Network of Canada Advisory Board. And we have Dr. Dorothy Lander on the extreme right here, retired faculty member ah, of the St. of X University Department of Adult Education. Arts-based researcher and educator, co-authored a research report for the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health, Art as a Determinant of Health. Serves on the Art Health Network of Canada Advisory Board. Also a founding member of Arts Health and Ganesh. But before I hand you over to this impressive panel of experts, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the many individuals who are playing an important role in addressing mental health issues. One of these individuals is Stella Ducklow, the young artist who created the compelling photographs in the gallery outside this auditorium. Ms. Ducklow is a teenmentalhealth.org artist in residence. Diagnosed with mental illness as a teenager, she is an accomplished advocate for those living with mental health issues. I read Ms. Ducklow's rationale for the Somewhere Project on her website and found it incredibly moving. Ms. Ducklow writes, Somewhere lays bare casual assumptions of what both illness and cure are supposed to look like. Asking the viewer to reconsider what it really means to be put somewhere. There is no somewhere, she says. There is no limbo where people who are sick or disruptive or different can be placed so society doesn't have to deal with them. The intended impact of this work is to shatter the well-preserved illusion that the appropriate response to people with mental health issues is to simply ignore them or have them put somewhere. 
Ms. Ducklow's work reminds us how important it is that we think outside the box. And I did have that statement made to me uh, a couple of times already this afternoon. To examine our notions of mental illness, and to find creative solutions to address the health care issues we currently face. We know that people living with mental health issues need supports beyond traditional health care. As the panel will discuss, the arts can play an important role in recovery. Now I believe it is time for me to hand things over uh, to, the, uh, to the panel which I uh, just, uh, just introduced. And uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for uh, coming out uh, today. Uh, I know that uh, as a community, to create, to create a strong community in our province of wellness, meeting the, the challenges, the needs of mental health, will need to be at the, at the forefront. And each of you in this room today will become more enlightened, more empowered by what the panel will have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. It's um, very encouraging to hear how committed you are personally to moving forward the agenda for better health. And you notice I'm not separating mental health from health. Better health for all the people of this province. So thank you for that. I guess I get to start off because I'm just sitting in this seat. <laughs> when I was thinking about the issues that we wanted to discuss today, and I hope this is a discussion, this is not, to me, a discussion about mental illness. This is a discussion about what do we need to do to be whole as human beings. What do we need to do to be whole as human beings? The most important thing that we can do is connect with each other. Because it's in that connectivity with each other that we grow as individuals, that we grow as communities, and that we grow as a global society. And Human connection is the key to improving the human condition. And it doesn't matter whether you have a broken leg or a broken brain or whatever. Human connection still is the key to improving the human condition. And the arts, the arts are fundamental to human connection. We would not be human without the arts. Literature, poetry, music, visual arts, dance. That, that is the core and essence of being a human being. If we look at the historical evolutionary record, the arts didn't come into historical play after technology. They didn't come into historical play after language. They didn't come into historical play after something. They came at the same time and shaped who we have been and shape who we are now and shape who we will be in the future. So I'm going to start off this discussion by saying that I hope I never hear the phrase art therapy again. <laughs> what I would like to see is the arts integrated into every single aspect of our human lives. In our schools, in our hospitals, in our homes, in every function of our community. So let's get rid of art therapy and let's just have human beings doing what human beings should be doing. 
Holy smokes. You're a hard act to follow, I'll tell you that. And I haven't had a microphone in my hand in a long time, so watch out. <laughs> I might not want to give it up. <laughs> the funny thing is, um, to, I'm used to having a microphone in my hand to introduce other people or to share other people's stories. So when I was asked to participate in this discussion, I quickly told Fatten I would be the weakest link because I'm the newest person uh, to this cause. But I also knew that uh, I wanted to sit here by you, Stan, on stage because one of the very first events I was involved with was the Academy in School Mental Health in July before I even started with my new position in August. And what Stan said when he was on the stage has uh, become something that I repeat all the time. And every time I repeat it, it gives me goosebumps. And you just said it. It is so simple and it just flows out of you. Making a human connection improves the human condition. And I can't say that without the little hairs on the back of my neck standing up. And I get it. And I got it that day I was sitting in the auditorium and you said that and I thought, I made the right choice because I want to work with people like Stan Kutcher who believe that and are working to make our society change the way it thinks about connecting with other people. Because this is what's so important, this eye to eye verbal connecting. And I'm sorry that you said you don't want to hear the term art therapy. <laughs> because I went to an art therapy class on Thursday evening because as a former journalist, I wanted to do my research. So I called the recreation therapist at the Abbey J. Lane and asked if I could come over to be a part of her programming. And it was on Thursday night and I thought, uh, I'm gonna go in, it was after our Inspiring Lives luncheon and get a sense of how art what, what role art plays. So the first thing that happened when I walked in is I went to take a seat off to the side and uh, the recreation therapist said, mm -mm -mm, no, you're coming to the table and you're creating art. So everyone came into the room and we made very brief introductions and people focused on creating their artwork. And what I discovered is within five or 10 minutes, the conversation really started to get underway. And it was unlike any conversation I've ever had with a group of people I had just met. Within 15 minutes, that conversation was touching on family, the importance of family. It was touching on serious topics like cancer, people living with cancer, people who had loved ones with cancer. It was focused on colors and creation and Everyone just looked down and focused on creating their artwork. And I thought, this is exactly what Stan was talking about, making that human connection. People were connecting with what they were creating, so they were able to let other things go and just talk. And as a former communicator, I know it's sometimes difficult to get people to talk, to open up and express what they need to express. And I watched that room fill that evening with people who openly opened their minds, opened their hearts, opened their creativity, and expressed what they were feeling on a canvas, but also verbalized it in a way that they never would have verbalized it had they not had the distraction of creating the art. So for me, as a former communicator, I thought, wow, if only I had have known to carry empty canvases with me when I was going out to do interviews. Because everyone opened up so much because it was just a creative, beautiful environment where everyone was just felt free to express themselves. So I just wanted to, to throw out that I entered that room with certain ideas about what the evening was going to be like, and for me, it was exactly the opposite. I left feeling pensive, I left feeling relaxed, and I also left feeling a little relieved because what ended up happening is I ended up expressing some of my own issues while I was creating my own piece of artwork and thought, wow, I get it. So I think there's definitely an intersection when it comes to art and mental health. And I did go to the art therapy class. <laughs> And I enjoyed it, but I'm not going to use the phrase art therapy anymore. I went to art class. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. So I'll uh, say something, because this is great. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me. 
and for um, for so many of you being here, this is wonderful. I was thinking about um, there's a couple of things came up. But first, maybe this word. Um, yeah, I agree about the therapy word, it, it, but with reservation. Uh, first, I will defend the word therapy because, um, of course, the, those of you who had a classical education will know that theraps means uh, one who serves or one who attends. And so it's a rather a lovely word. And indeed, when I was a doctor for many, many, well, I guess I'm still a doctor because people keep asking me for a diagnosis or for therapy for their conditions, even though I have no license anymore in Canada anyway. Uh, however, uh, I will say that, uh, uh, I will say that, uh, yeah, no, all the time, at racquetball, I have about uh, ten, ten of us old men, and they're always asking me, and I say, well, listen, I'll tell you what I think about this, and then I say, but, but beware, I don't have a license to practice, so anyway, I don't want to get off the point. I think Theraps is a, we used to be called the, Who's the attending? That was the thing. As you may know in university hospitals, the doctor who is sort of on call is the attending. There's also one who serves, both of which have come from that word therapy. So I, I just wanted to defend. However, having said that, I, my main reason for being here, I'm certainly not an expert. I, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, as uh, J.M. Barry, who created Peter Pan, said, I'm not young enough to know everything, which I like that idea. So. And I'm also um, not old enough to know nothing, which apparently is where you end up. So I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm knowing less and less anyway. But I know less and less. But I will say that um, when we, what I did was why I probably am here is because I am I, I, I health excellent, not mental, physical, or anything like that. That this as if they were separate. It's a, it's a, it's a holistic concept. Health and health, not illness, is what we're talking about, right? Doctors. In fact, if you go to the big books on uh, medical um, uh, publications, you very, very difficult to find the word health there. When you're looking for a category, let me look up some articles on health. You don't find them in the medical literature. It's very interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, we had uh, the, the notion about 25 years ago to open the doors of this big hospital that I was at to artists, because uh, I couldn't find anyone amongst my colleagues to talk to, actually, about things that worry me. And I began to think that, um, I began to hang out with artists because they seem to have something to say. And, and also, um, it, some, that they were good at listening and really good at uh, paying attention. These were good therapists, I could see it, even though they would never have called themselves therapists, perhaps. And so what we did was we opened the door to artists and in came the artists and we were very quickly aware that we should never refer to ourselves or the artists would never refer to themselves as therapists. Occupational therapists got quite upset. What are these people? So, oh no, recreational therapists. Oh no, we're, no, 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 we're not art, we're not music, etc. So, therefore, I strongly actually concur with avoiding the word therapists in this kind of context. The other thing I want to just, just pick up on is this thing. I, I wanted to um, emphasize this, this, it's not an us them thing, right? And I know nobody in this, I'm sure nobody in this uh, room would disagree. Um, in fact, let me just put it to you. Um, how many in here has never had a bad day, or felt a bit under the weather, or is trying to live one day at a time and find several days coming along at once? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're all, I, I tell you, as a, I was very sick as a teenager. It took me till I was 37, mentally, in a terrible state. But it took me till I was 36, and I've been practicing medicine for 10 years before I realized Oh my God, I begin to see that I had some mental health issues as a teenager. I wish I'd had the kind of enlightened folks around me, like Sam and many others of you, to help me see that. And also, I wish I'd had artists hanging out with me uh, in those days, but I, because I didn't take advantage. And without going on about it too much, I, I, I think the other point I want to just bring out that seems really relevant to this discussion is that there's a lot of literature, as Dorothy has pointed out to me more than once, that um, shows that uh, artists are highly represented in those with quote-unquote mental illnesses. Um, well, that doesn't mean that making art makes you mentally ill, I can assure you. That's not, it's not the cause, I mean, not because of the, the association doesn't uh, indicate the cause uh, or prove a cause. It's obviously that there's something about those who have allowed themselves through their teenage years and later on to 
maintain their connection with the arts that are more, uh, let's say, uh, more openly or more vulnerable, perhaps, uh, uh, psychologically vulnerable in some important way. I mean, this is just a thing I throw out for discussion because I think it's very, very interesting. But there is this, no doubt there is an association, and be, many of you know, may know this. Um, so I just wanted to put that out as a discussion point that, um, that, uh, that, that, that the arts uh, have the opportunity for uh, getting in touch with your um, vulnerable self, your feelings, your gut, your heart, your soul, as opposed to just being in your head all the time, which is what unfortunately we're encouraged to be so much, particularly once we get beyond the first few years of life. Um, I, but I just put one other question out to, to you for discussion. Is there anyone in here who's not a child? And, and sometimes we may think, well, we're not children, but you've just celebrated Mother's, many of us have celebrated Mother's Day. Uh, well, we, it's easier to think of ourselves as grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, even great-grandchildren. So we are, all of us, of course, still children to our mothers anyway and fathers. And so it's kind of helpful to remember that because there's no one as a child, I mean someone less than 10, who didn't make a picture or didn't tell a story or didn't play a creative game and so on and so forth. So, you know, clearly it's in us, it's inherent as Mr. Hannah said. I mean, it's clearly, it's, it's hardwired into us to make art and where the heck did the child in us go? I guess I'll just put that as a very rhetorical question. Shut up. <laughs> right. Well, I'll just follow on from the idea of being a child. Um, we're hardwired for art, and it, and it starts right from birth. There's a um, um, one of my favorite sources, which is an anthropologist. Um, Alan Desamayaki, she's written a book called Homo Aestheticus. And she talk, she has looked at mother, baby, mostly mothers, mothers and baby connections across cultures. And the first thing that happens with the mother and a baby is making art. The, the, the lullabies, the cooing, it, it's relational. As Stan said, art is about making connections. So mother and baby, um, the, the cooing and the smiling, and uh, we were just in Tim Hortons before, before we came here. And there was, we, we saw the multimedia duet, that's what she calls it, the multimedia duet happening, um, happening in Tim Hortons this, this, this very day when the, when the mother and the baby smiling back and they're, they're cooing at you. That's, that's making art. Um, and. Uh, I, I'd like to think of it um, also as um, uh, art is what makes us fully, it, ma it makes us fully human. And it also, I think it gets in touch with our, our, our animal selves. Um, we've just lost a, a wonderful advocate of, of, of our animal selves in Farley Owens. And he would often say that, um, in, in some ways, animals are are um, more are superior to humans um, um, and can handle the distresses of life better because they don't have this this rational brain that you have to have an explanation for um, for um, for everything. Um, so what happens between it's mostly nonverbal that happens in that first artistic connection in in life. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, tell you a little story um, about um, my own, um, it's, it's an animal story, um, but it's, it's the way of dealing with distresses in an animal kind of way. Like if, a, if an animal, if a cheetah is attacked by a lion um, and, 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 and survives it, um, they just go back to, um, they just go back to play. They, they, there are to distress. You can you can flee, you can fight, or you can freeze. That's a problem when you freeze <laughs> and you're in a stuck place. So this is my this is my story. 
and it's a very recent story. When I was 13 years old, um, <laughs> I, was, I was riding my bike to choir practice. And this is a long time ago because I was wearing a skirt, if you could imagine riding a bike in a skirt. And um, I was chased by a German shepherd that, um, that bit, bit me in the, in the rear. And I, w I was terrified, and I have been till till about three weeks ago. I have been terrified of German shepherds. I was froze. Like I don't do what I didn't do what animals do, which is to maybe reenact re the experience. And, and you know, I I have stayed. I love dogs, but I am I have been terrified of German shepherds. So um, I was in England. Um, few weeks ago and, um, and, J and John's son invited us to come for lunch and then walk the dog, his, his foster mother's dog. I thought, thought that was great. The dog was a German Shepherd Husky. But I was, I was, I was, um, so I, my immediate thing was to, was to freeze because that's what I always do when I see a German Shepherd. So, um, I got to, we walked in nature, we walked through this park with the most placid German Shepherd that I, have, that I, that I have ever seen. And like I really do believe that I'm not going to be afraid of German Shepherds anymore. So um, if we could all go, if we could find out, if we could all find our animal selves and, and discharge that energy when we're, when we're in a, in a, a distressing uh, situation. Um, I think that, that is a, a good thing to do. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch about is about the language. Um, I come, I, I'm an educator, I'm not a, I'm not a healthcare um, professional in, in, in any sense. Um, but I think that um, our, our health and wellness, I think is, is, is the province of education as much as of, um, of medicine. And um, I, I think if we could, we would do well to change the language from, from medical language to um, educational language. Um, I, if we, I think if we thought of um, mental health in terms of, um, it, to be fully human is in fact to have some kind of a limitation and to experience loss, to experience trauma. That is about, um, um, being fully human, but do we ever hear it talked about as being fully human to actually have to deal with uh, loss and transition and trauma? Um, and if we thought of, of um, even a mental illness as, as a gift, um, as a resource, because um, Lewis Hyde is an author who has written a, written a gift, and he talks about the brokenness in our life is actually a resource for uh, digging deeper into into our into our beliefs and um, finding our authentic self. If we didn't have that as a resource, um, so the gift of thinking about uh, mental illness as a gift relationship and it is relational. I think that's a that's a nice kind of language, a helpful kind of language to think about it. And you know, even the title of this um, recovery to me, recovery kind of has a medical sound of it. And, and it, um, I, I wonder, and I, I would guess I want to challenge the idea of recovery is that that we fail somehow if we don't recover from from um, our distresses, that somehow we fail. <coughs> it's it's kind of a biomedical thing. If we're not cured. The medical profession has failed if, they, if, if something isn't, isn't cured. Um, but um, and survivors, that's another that's another language thing around mental health. Is, um, uh, psychiatric survivors. Um, but if if you're using the arts and, and sharing your stories or doing that through dance or whatever, what about being witnesses? that you're witnesses to, to each other. So that's another kind of language that, that edu educators might use rather than survivors. Um, 
People from the audience want to participate. It would be great to have you do that. Please. I haven't thought this so really well, but I'm a educator in training, and that my question would be around how we can better incorporate art and creative experiences in school because there's not a lot of that right now and in fact what i'm seeing more so is uh you know an art project that is the same for everyone they might get to change the colors but that's about it so that that to me is more so a conforming restricted art exercise as opposed to the art that we actually would be wanting to see for our youth and in, in school. So I'm wondering, maybe that might go to the minister uh, <laughs> uh, on what your colleagues are saying about. Where's my chair on here. <laughs> it, it seems to me there's a really big disconnect there in what we're giving for opportunities for children to be creative when we all know that they need to be but it seems to I have two kids still in school and art was squashed down to it's not a whole lot. So I don't know if there's a question yet. <laughs> other than policy wise. Well I, well I would only just say I, no, I think it's very good to hear what the minister has to say even though you can go, I can give up my chair anyway. <laughs> But I, I will just say, I think that I, I do think that there's a societal terror of letting the artists in us free. I mean, we're all artists. I think if we were really, uh, I'd really like to hear what Stan says about this, but I think that, um, that the, the mental health professions across the board uh, are probably um, it's somehow involved in this. You know, if the uh, anyone who wants to take over, and if you're a despot, you want to take over a, a country. The first thing you do is you get rid of the artists, suppress the artists, get rid of all the art, get rid of the artists, because they're the ones, the power. I mean, if we release the art, artist within us, all of us, really freely, uh, without risk of being locked up because we're on drugs or something, and because that's how you'll appear, once you really let your expressive selves go, um, then uh, we'll be in, society will be in serious trouble. That would, what I, that's my provocative statement about it. You know, it doesn't help, what are we going to do about it? Because we've got to jolly well say, hey, we've got to give art its power, not just for health, but as, you, as Dorothy said, for education for our societal change. I, I think artists are absolutely where it should be. Anyway, I, that's my immediate response. I, I, I completely agree with John on that particular point. <laughs> it, it has occurred to me that when, when we were in school, when Ann and I were in school together, <laughs> we did art and we did music and we did phys ed. And I wish Ann Blackwood was here from the Department of Education because she's been such a champion for arts in the schools. And then that vanished from the school system. And we've imploded. I'm going to say something really, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. We've replaced it with courses called social emotional learning. And I wonder if it was the art and the music and the phys ed which were the social emotional learning of my generation and we didn't have to sit in class and learn how to talk to each other because we could do it through our expressions and we could do it on the playground and yes sometimes you hit someone in the nose yeah, and then they hit you back and you didn't do it again okay that's called <laughs> learning not to hit <laughs> and, and we took that right out and then we had, well now we have to sit in class and have a course on how to talk to each other, which I think is sort of ludicrous. I'd love to see play come back. I'd love to see art come back. I'd love to see music come back. I'd love to see phys ed come back in our schools and in everyday 
life. It would be pretty neat to see that. As a parent to a 19-year-old and an 11-year-old, my experience with art in the school system has been hit or miss, and a lot of it comes down to the educator. It comes down to the teacher's own interests. And if the teacher has a keen interest in making art a part of her curriculum, then the children are exposed to it. If the teacher does not have that keen interest, then it's not part of what the children get excited about. They may be exposed to it, but they don't get excited about it. So, not that I'm an expert in the topic, but if you're heading into education and you have a keen interest in that, I'd say the best thing you can do is hang on to it and just figure out how to make it work with the curriculum you're given in our province today to put that spin on it. And the other thing that Stan said a little earlier that I think I tend to forget sometimes too is when we talk about art, we're not just talking about a painting on a wall. For me, my artistic release is writing. It always has been. Literature, you mentioned literature. And teaching our children about writing too. When my daughter comes home with a really great creative story that she's written, I view that as art, as the teacher honing her skills and giving her confidence to become a better artist, even though it's not charcoal and paint on the canvas. I think it's important to remember that art has slipped to us sideways, and that, and that if, if we can slip it in the, in the back door as educators. Um, I spent uh, most of my adult career um, at St. Bex University, but not in, the, not in the school system, but as the manager of residences, food service, and cleaning service. And there is amazing, I mean, you have to think about it, most of our learning actually does happen outside the classroom. And so outside the classroom is a wonderful opportunity for slipping in art. And, and, and thinking of other arts than, than just the traditional ones, like the culinary arts, um, there, um, there are wonderful opportunities um, for uh, students to um, prepare meals and, and cook together. And we maybe don't think of that as making art, but it's definitely making art. So it's just an amazing thing. Thank you very much, uh, Star. I'm glad you gave up the microphone for a moment here. But uh, that's a great question that was uh, that was asked. And in 1972 uh, was my first year teaching, and it was in uh, Labrador City, and it was a school really, really well funded by the Iron Ore Company of Canada, and uh, we had a full art program uh, in the school. And it was a marvelous opportunity for primary to grade 8 students to be constantly uh, engaged in art uh, as it came right across the curriculum. We had uh, students would have an opportunity to go visit uh, our art teacher and see how it could be integrated into their uh, curriculum. Uh, at the school where I ended up teaching, which is uh, which was uh, West Kings District High School in the Annapolis Valley, we've been able to hold on to two courses that we work to have every student in grade 10 uh, take one or the other as an option, and it is uh, art, because we've happened to have a couple of teachers on staff who are artists and who know the value of that whole wide spectrum that uh, art can offer. So art and drama are either or pretty well for every grade 10 student in our school. But STAR is exactly right. It's a real hit and miss uh, across our province. I, I hope some of you here today uh, will take the opportunity by way of the, uh, uh, of the internet or perhaps uh, when uh, uh, Myra Freeman and the commission that is looking at the the curriculum and the and the future of what we should have in our school uh, system 
Uh, you know, this is one of those glorious opportunities. We haven't had a review in our province for 25 years. And, uh, and, I, and I think what we're talking about here today should not be in isolation uh, from that great expressive way uh, that we can use. Just recently, I had one of those moments where clarity from, from the mind, the feeling, and emotions of a seven-year-old came so vividly to me. My, my brother lost his leg in an industrial accident. And uh, my little granddaughter at seven, she was in my apartment in Halifax here when we found out about it. And she never said a word. And she went to the table, she got out her crayons, and she did three pictures, three slides of her feelings about uh, Papa's brother. And you know, children and all of us need those kinds of, uh, I think, of opportunities. And we're pretty well devoid of them really in our school system and I, and I think that we have a glorious opportunity now to at least at some in some manner or way uh, to get I think more art uh, in our curriculum in the province so hopefully some of you will make that a little mission out of today and it doesn't have to be a long treatise it can just be again that those words to the Commission that may be helpful thank you sort of a comment slash question. I'm a creative arts therapist, so I come with this particular adversarial view to some of the comments on the, on the panel about art therapy being not wanting to be heard again. And I think one of the reasons we have art therapy as opposed to art as therapy, which is a very different thing but also very valuable, is because we are not legitimized in the system. Artists cannot go into a system that exists right now in the medical system and do as much work as you know they maybe could. And so, you know, creative arts therapies and specific interventions have been developed for the purposes of sort of making our way into the system and helping people through those connections that we know happen through art. Um, so, if I think if I think art was really legitimized, I think that wouldn't have been said. I, I honestly don't know. Um, yeah, I feel kind of, um, I, I just was, I wanted to know more of what you meant by that, perhaps. Um, and I also wanted to remind about some of the languages. Some of the language that we use, um, I think can be um, sort of dialed down to more common humanistic connecting language. I like, I like what you said about that. I think though, if we're going to um, sort of blur the lines of art therapy. We should also blur the lines of other therapies. In an ideal world, we would not need any type of therapy. We would not need medication. We would not need any, need any of these things. But um, we, we don't have that system right now. So I just wondered um, if there was any you know, plan to introduce creative arts therapists into the system further who have specific expertise in how to bring specific interventions to individuals who are suffering. And, and the reasons why we have them is because, well, I think a lot of arts programming and arts systems around our province and around the world have become infiltrated by competition and sort of capitalistic ideals. And there's a lot of that in art that we want to sort of move past and, and come back to the healing and connection and all of that that art really is. And that's why I think um, we have art therapies because we don't have an art um, world anymore that is as as pure and uh, and so I think it's it's important and I, I wondered if you had any more to say to that about <laughs> about art therapy being and I mean it's certainly I mean there's different forms of art therapy that are evidence-based and for different applications and we don't need to talk about that but I just wondered um, why there wasn't a focus on on that or why it was rejected thanks Since I was the first one that said I'd like to not see art therapy, let me be very clear about what I mean by that. Sure. I mean that if you have art therapy, you have a thing. And that art should be integrated into everything and shouldn't be a standalone thing. This is what I meant. And that I really feel that we can grab ownership. I own this thing. You own this thing. I own this thing. 
And if we keep doing that, we're eventually going to have just a whole bunch of little fiefdoms and no one's going to be interacting. So my challenge to you, or I and to everybody else, is to let's stop thinking about all these things as things and let's see how we can integrate all those components which are essential, and we know are essential, for, for, for being human beings and bring them together instead of let's go do art therapy, let's go do music therapy, let's go do psychotherapy, let's do occupational therapy, as everybody is carving out their own little fiefdom. Yeah. Let's, I can't see any reason. In fact, people with your skill sets should have been in our system decades ago. And I think one of the reasons that it has been a problem is because we have continued to compartmentalize all the different parts of human existence. And we don't move ahead if we stay in compartments. Yeah, so I, I would think that would be a point to the whole mental health system then, to do that, not just a challenge to artists. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, <clears throat> I just have a quick cool question about uh, your opinion on a certain subject, and which is more or less to uh, the mental health side of things than uh, art side of things. But uh, it's the concept of uh, social media itself is more like a double-edged sword where uh, individuals have, you know, over, let's say, 300 friends, but still feel even more uh, alone than they did beforehand. Uh, do you have any idea or any opinions or possibly yeah, any ideas that you can combat this, this concept or, you know, um, lots of words now. But um, yeah, that can combat this, uh, combat uh, this idea of social media being used for the opposite um, way that it was being meant to be used for. Like for example, uh, an individual who has 300 friends on, let's just say Facebook or MySpace or something like that would uh, update their status every day and nobody would comment. That would make them feel even more, not, I wouldn't say secure, but alone in a, a space or environment that is actually supposed to make you feel, you know, more connected. How would, do you have any idea or any opinions to combat that, that concept? That's a really tough question because that's like walking down the street trying to make eye contact with people who don't look up. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I keep walking down the street and keep looking for people to make eye contact and try and find that person who will look up would be the way I'd combat it in real life. Um, I'm, but I'm really glad you touched on social media because social media is uh, something that I was rather forced to become a part of when I was at CTV Atlantic because it was the way of the world. and we did put ourselves out there and develop these social media circles, which can be incredibly strong, which can also be incredibly toxic if they're not handled properly or because people somehow feel anonymous when they're on social media. Um, so as far as trying to make that problem go away, my best advice would be to try and get involved with groups that support the same ideas and the same feelings that you live with and support on a daily basis and try and turn to group interactions as opposed to individual interactions. Yes. Uh, Colleen Frazier is here in the audience. She's our communications coordinator at the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. And what we found with social media is people reach out to us on social media typically after dark. And people reach out to us on social media with the type of questions that they perhaps should be asking their family or friends. And when we respond, even if it's just with a phone number or a small piece of information, the feeling we get back is that, that they're just so thankful that we reached out to them. And I'm not saying that to say, or isn't the Mental Health Foundation in Nova Scotia great? I'm saying that to say it speaks volumes to what your point is, that there are people that they're connected to who should be part of the conversation but aren't. Hi, my name is Brandon. Um, I would just like to make a comment. It's not really a question, but maybe a comment that you guys could discuss. Um, 
I found when I was in school, I just graduated last year, there were some teachers who gave more options as to how to address a certain project or whatever. And as an artist, that's when I take my chance to express that artisticness, whether in any class really, because of the opportunity. Because art, like you said, it, can, it, it shouldn't be compartmentalized because <clears throat> it can really be used through a number of different subjects. Because I don't know, I see it as a, a method of expression rather than a subject. Like when I think art, I don't think art class. I just think of it in the broader terms as the tool that it is for expression and communication. But so I would think that maybe in teacher training or some sort of I'm not really sure how that happens, but if there was more encouragement to leave options open as how to address a certain assignment, uh, we would see a lot more artistic means being used in the school system and by students, and that would kind of give them the freedom to do that. So. Hi. I'm also a creative arts therapist, or th working on my creative arts therapy um, in dance movement. Unfortunately, there's no certification program here in Canada for that. There is in Europe and mm -hmm. the States, but we're still behind. Um, the, I'm so I'm actually elated that we're having this conversation um, as a part of integrating movement and dance and or um, dance and art and drama and culinary skills and horticulturalism or whatever it is that you want to incorporate into um, the process of health and recovery or um, for people experiencing mental health issues or physical health issues or whatever. Um, I, this has been going on since the 30s. They've been incorporating this in the States. Uh, Dorothea Dix at St. Elizabeth Hospital <coughs> was one of the first people who was instrumental in incorporating it into the psychiatric unit at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, or the institution. And it started actually working with um, veterans of the war. Um, and they were incorporating drama therapy and movement therapy and art therapy into the setting. Um, and it made, um, it opened up doors, avenues for people who, to express themselves who were not able to verbally do so um, for one reason or the other. And so they were making progress within themselves. So the fragmented individual became um, a whole by incorporating the use of medication, therapy, um, movement therapy, drama therapy, art therapy, they were able to start feeling who they were again and integrating themselves as a whole person. Um, it was done in Israel at another hospital um, and they were, they, so it's, it's grown and it's become a part of their culture in many places. Canada is a little bit far behind in this um, although there are certain certification programs, we are not incorporating it into our education system, into our mental health system, as much as we could be. And I think we need to start pushing that um, because some people just don't have the capability at certain points to verbally express themselves, right? So we have to use other methods of interacting with them so they can do so. Um, in the school system, I had the great opportunity, and I volunteered my services for four years at C.P. Allen High in the Learning Resource Center, working with kids who were not always integrated into the mainstream system. Um, and I used movement as a way and a means to communicate with them. Um, it, was, it was the one, and I felt touched by this because there were several individuals who accessed that program once a week for two hours um, that they were the I was the only person that they actually connected with once a week um, and other teachers could did not have that same connection um, and they couldn't figure out you know they there was a one person who came in who was an aut autism specialist and she's like well how can be so excited to see her right and the teacher said, he's the only person who he gets excited about seeing once a week. And we don't have to encourage him to be, in, like, to motivate him to do anything. He stands up and he's out there, right? And that could have been drama therapy, it could have been music, it could have been dance, it could have been whatever. 
but there was some sense of connection that he needed beyond verbal, right? Um, and so I, I also work at Millwood High right now, and I feel privileged to be able to do that. Um, and there is a sense of connection with those students as well. Um, and there's, then again, there's an individual who wasn't even participating in the class. Two weeks ago, he started participating and he actually led the group in an exercise. So I'm just expressing this because I think we really, it, it needs to move from talk to action faster than it is right now. Um, we've got some incredible creative arts therapy, arts therapy people in this community. Take advantage of them. Let them use their skills in your education system, in your mental health system, um, in the community as a whole. Um, embrace them, value their work, and I think we will see a healthy community come together in a global perspective a lot faster than it is right now. So more power to you and I think if we have people to work with who strongly value um, what we have to give, um, yeah, I'm, I'm open for conversation, I'm open for linking and I think anybody who is in the creative arts therapy world right now in this province would be for, like, would be in wanting to sit down with you and engage in conversation and how, see how we can work together to make it happen. So. Hi there, my name is Marta. Um, feeling some emotion and vulnerability in the moment. Um, I wrote something that I will share for my creative um, self. Um, but I wanted to say one of the things for me around art is heart. You know, I love to play with words and art is in heart. And I think it goes way beyond um, the spectrum of mental health and recovery, although I know that's our focus today. Um, for me, um, art is one of those experiences where I get to integrate my logic and structure with my feelings and flow. And it just happens, it's an experience. It's nothing I have to learn. It's an opportunity for um, all the aspects from many years of therapy and medication and all the things that I um, needed to learn to really grow up and learn how to take responsibility for myself, taking all of that and playing with it in whatever art form I choose to express in the moment. And I want that for everyone. You know, I just don't want that for those of us who are labeled with mental illness or those of us who are children in, in the schools. Um, you mentioned um, the child, and oh, you posed the question, I've forgotten your name, where is the child? You know, um, I lost my child a long time ago, and my process in mental wellness was finding her again. And with the right supports and community of support, you know, she's alive and thriving. And I think we all need that. Our world is calling for that in many ways. Um, so I just want to offer these words. A little intimidating because Laura's in the audience and uh, I know Laura, I'm sorry, but she's someone who has inspired me to step up in the mic even in this moment, so I just needed to say that. As we come together, breathing, connecting, daring to be creative, each one facing inner dragons and dialogues, gathering gifts here, there and everywhere, I step forth just saying kindness, loving kindness, meeting people heart to heart, Needing openness, playing quietly, responding silently to the inner call underneath it all. Voicing waves of energy exactly as you feel, zealously free to be. Let's nurture the heart and art so together we can create wholeness and wellness. An important piece of that is funding. We desperately need the funding. Uh, and, you know, I know this is something that is said to you all the time. Um, not th only through the government, we as individuals, myself included, I need to learn how to take responsibility. I want to collaborate with all the groups so there are not ten of us applying for the same grant to do the same thing in the community. The people offering, you know, uh, to support us don't want that anymore either. We can't afford to do that. So it's exciting to see that there are perhaps so many people here from different organizations we have to let our own walls down, we have to really support each other and do what each one of us does best and do it together. Thank you.
the, the, the child in you is very, very much alive and well. And thank you, Martha. Welcome. This kind of circus performer. Hi. Uh, hi, my name's Megan. Um, here for a couple things. I first want to sort of defend the term survivor. Um, I think that part of it does go to the, the dialogue of the naturalism of how you deal with the, the situation and the mental blockage that can occur to you when you're facing any sort of health issue, mental or physical. Um, and that at, at a certain point it comes to, it's not just learning to get over the freeze with the German Shepherd, it's waking up with the German Shepherd on your chest every day. And you have to bring it to work with you, and you bring it to your friends with you. And they all know it's there, and they all want to, they all wish you would leave it behind and just not freeze. But you can't. You deal with it every day, and sometimes the, sometimes it's just getting up in the morning and being able to function with the German Shepherd and having to wake up every morning and not freeze. I think that, that in and of its way, deserves the ter term survivor sometimes. And it's not necessarily about the recovery, but it is about being able to cope and being able to make it every day past that. So that's just sort of my, my take on the, the term as survivor. Sorry, by the way. Oh, that was fun. And I guess the other thing that I want to, that I sort of want to bring up, because we do discuss art therapy, and because I do defend the term survivor, not necessarily the idea that people need to get over these things, but that they, you, you do as a person need to still be able to function in order to live your life with whether you're physically or mentally injured. And to, to that end, I think that part of the important discussion that goes on with um, mental health and with art is that not only do you try and uh, move forward through it and have it help you with your life, but the important part of breaking down the stigma that happens right now is that a lot of people just don't understand what it's like to try and go through your everyday with the sort of things you're dealing with. And that's why the photographs outside and people who find a way to express what it is to be in deep depression or to live with OCD and that sort of thing, to, to, to create a sort of art and a sort of fundamental human connection that even somebody who's never experienced those sensations and that sort of feeling can go, oh, I see, that will prevent them from then or at least help them to understand the situation of someone who's, who's going through that and will lessen the chance that they stigmatize that person. I think if we create more of that dialogue through the connectivity that is art, that we, we create an easier situation, not only for the people who are dealing with the mental illness or mental health issues or physical health issues, but for the people who are trying to understand them as well. And I think that that's, that's a big part of, uh, of the conversation that needs to go on. question for you this time. Um, it's often known as the million dollar question. If you were to wake up tomorrow morning thinking about our teen, the state of teen mental health, and you could change anything and have anything implemented, take all the restrictions aside, what would it be? What, what, what do you think that would be? winning fix could, might include, at least. I, I know it's probably not a one thing, but maybe your, your most important thing. <laughs> I have the mic again. <laughs> Stan, you need to pick yours up. Um, I'm going to answer that question personally, because what I need it most from the mental health system probably six years ago, was for my son to have known that it was okay for him to tell me what was happening in his life. So I think if there's one thing that I wish and that I could fix, it would be that children wouldn't have to worry about being judged. They could just be kids and express their problems when they're happening and not be ashamed. Because once my son told us he needed help, we were able to help him, but we couldn't help him when we didn't know. So I guess my big wish is awareness and giving children, not just talking to our kids about the birds and the bees and 
bullies and all those things that are important university decisions but having the conversations around the kitchen table at night about mental illness and about the warning signs and about the fact that it's okay to talk about it that would be my wish I, I would echo that I would say that I would like to see I had one wish I would like our society to realize that when we invest in children and families, we get a lot more back than when we invest in jails and F-35s. Um, I, I'll just say, I, I, this word connectivity came up quite a bit. Um, I would like to hear, the, and Marty used it, I know, the word love, I know you did in that lovely piece. Um, Dorothy and I wrote a piece called Love Medicine. Um, I would love, to, I would, I would, I just crave to see more love that allows for a person, in this case, we're talking about teenagers, to express themselves, and we're talking about art, and to give full recognition to the need for, uh, for us to be able to make contact in the street so it's all right and to express ourselves freely without being thought that we're on some kind of uh, we need to be suppressed we need to be on drugs or something like this to shut us down i want to allow i would love to see where um society was open to the child in all of us being maintained and sustained right through those shut down teenage years and on out from there how we do it, well, it's going to take some radical changes. And it isn't the minister's fault. I mean, the minister's responsibility, I should say, fault. Uh, responsibility to take. It's our whole society. We are a democracy, after all. We are, it's up to us, really, to just be willing to lay down our, our walls, as somebody also said, and be open to each other. And that's love. Elizabeth Kubler Ross says the only thing that heals is unconditional love. Um, and I, I think we're, we're afraid of the word love, so it's uh, um, hard to love. Um, I have a, a question and a, and a comment. Uh, the question is more on the practical uh, data, I guess, around. Uh, some of the numbers I mentioned earlier that it's one in five or such. Um, it's also acknowledged um, that a lot of people um, develop these challenges in their teens and in early adulthood. I was wondering if there was any more uh, focused numbers on what you'd find in an environment like this, like a college, um, and how much higher would those numbers be given those two facts? Um, the, uh, so that's the question. Uh, the comment is uh, more on the terminology. Uh, we talked a lot about some of the stigmas associated with um, mental health. Um, and I just wanted to comment on also the stigma, stigmas associated with the term art. And uh, the fact that it's very easy for a lot of people to dismiss art. And I think if we change the conversation to um, creativity and the connectedness, that we'd have a, a much diff different conversation. Um, and it'd be easier to implement that uh, across the board. Because uh, you'd be hard pressed to have somebody to stand up and say, it's not worthy of being creative in schools. Where it's sometimes easy to put art aside. I think Stan, you're the best one to talk about the numbers and adolescent mental health. But I just, you just made me remember something I wanted to say when the gentleman over here was speaking about if there were more options when you're doing projects. The other uh, thing to add on to that is when you choose to make the poster or the mobile, that it's not looked at as the easy way out. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. I never thought of what you just said, and I'm going to start thinking about that, because that, 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 that you challenged me to think differently. Thank you for that. Um, I, I share an, an anecdote. When, when my oldest son, God knows how he ever went to school, I don't know, uh, he somehow went, went it through. Um, he had a mental disorder called ADHD. It was really, really tough for him, but he was incredibly creative. And I can remember in one class, he was given the class was given an assignment to to um, describe an apple. And so one of the things that he did is he went into Greek mythology and talked about how apples had been used. And then and he then he talked about the apple, the apple. And then he talked. He then he did a whole piece on the big apple, which I thought was pretty interesting metaphorically in New York. And, and I remember the teacher's comment was, "What has this got to do with apples?" Oh. Uh, talk about shutting down basic creativity, which is your point. You know, the, the numbers. If we look at the illnesses, yeah, you know, those are the numbers. Um, and, so in any group, any large enough population, that's the numbers you get, as the minister said. But, you know, this is beyond the numbers. I think that all of us have challenges in our lives, and those challenges are not necessarily a mental illness, but they're still challenges, and that we can help each other through those challenges. And so when someone is stressed out, what are some of the things they can do? They can do things which are good for them their health and well-being, they can listen to music as long as it's not Mahler. Uh, <laughs> I'm really getting depressed, I was Mahler, oh my god, I'm depressed. <laughs> you know, but uh, you, 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 you can play music, you can write, you can do poetry, you know, all those things that, 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 that help us in our day-to-day -day lives, and they're just part of the, the repertoire we have as human beings. So I think that everybody needs that. And, and everybody needs that at all, to all times in their lives. Thank you for reframing the question. You look at kids nowadays, and you don't see them bicycling to school anymore. You don't see them just running around in the park. Uh, they're driven, every, driven everywhere, right? As public space closes, or things cost, or things have to be structured to do what you want to play, we lose that creativity and imagination from a very early age as we prioritize other things, cars, etc. Uh, and uh, that's just a comp to make on that idea around health. Thank you. I think there's time for one more question. Um, I guess this is, follows from a previous gentleman's comment, but um, my name is Jessica and I'm, uh, I have my master's in school psychology and working on my PhD. And um, so I think about this all the time mental health, education, and our communities. Um, one of the key things that I think we need to do as a group is break down barriers, break down barriers between um, generations so that youth can have conversations with their families um, safely and freely so that they can feel comfortable to do that. So that families can have conversations with schools about what their kids need in their schools because families know their kids and they know what they need. And um, we shouldn't have a barrier between schools and families. But um, in going alongside of that, um, a word that keeps popping into my head is empowerment. And so I feel like we need to empower our youth, empower them to speak um, for what they need. When we have a conversation about intersections of heart, um, art and mental wellness, I think that you should be a part of it and you should tell us about what they feel like they want in their communities, what they want to see what they need to be able to feel safe and well. Um, but we also do need to empower each other, need to empower teachers to do the things that a lot of people talked about today, to be able to f feel free to do different things with the curriculum that they're given. Um, teachers sometimes get a bad rep for, for doing the hardest job out there, and um, we need to empower them both in their education um, programs from right from that point where they can feel like moving into their jobs they can do the things that they signed up for in that they they want to give kids um, the best shot at their life through their education and then we also need to empower the kids and uh, to, to be able to to do that with their own education and to be able to express themselves throughout it so 
That was just my sort of comment. It's not really a question, but. is actually a question I promise I'll make it really short. Um, so this is, uh, I don't use the term stigma anymore, I, just, I use the term discrimination. And I'm an artist and I love working with mental health advocates, but one thing I find really problematic is the stereotype of the romantic creative artist genius. We have Picasso, you know, we have this idea of a romanticization of suffering as if suffering is necessary in art. And as an artist, I use a lot of rationality in my work. So I'm wondering, and this is mostly for the gentleman on the end, um, how do we talk about art and mental health without furthering this romantic notion of madness as creativity, or without furthering the stereotype of everyone who's suffering being somehow closer to creativity? Um, oh, ah, um, I hope I didn't come across as uh, Suggest well, uh, you know, stereotypes are something I run a million miles from, so I'm sorry if that's how I came across. Um, it's just to me that, well, uh, I'll be very brief, haven't I? Um, I just think that folks who are out, out and are willing to say, I have um, psychological problems, I'll just put it that broadly, um, uh, I suggest that one of the great um, uh, groups of advocates for such people are artists because artists I think have uh, having maybe it's in common with there is this co-association what it means or why it's there I don't know but I do think it suggests that artists can be from my experience when I was working in a hospital as a doctor I couldn't find fellow doctors to talk to about things that really mattered to me but I could talk to artists and we very quickly like uh, was being said you know, once you got into a group of, uh, a community of um, folks uh, who were sitting around and, and making art, then quickly the conversation turned to the really deep issues that were troubling us. And, in, in, and confidentially, we could speak to each other, we could cry, we could laugh, and so on. And so uh, all, I, I, uh, all I think I want to say about, it's not about madness, that's for sure, because that's a very stereotyped idea, isn't it? It's about the fact that Artists are more open, more vulnerable, more and that's more creative, more expressive, and so forth. And I, I think that it's a great place to look for uh, help. You don't have to go to a psychotherapist or even, dare I say, a psychiatrist if you've got to make it. But an artist will, it will, and they're around. There's lots of artists around. So for those of us who are looking for someone, uh, my experience is uh, artists are as good as it gets when it when you're looking for someone to be able to share your troubles with. I think that's, <laughs> hope, I hope that's helpful. I just want to say a quick thank you to some people before and comes and, and closes the session, uh, particularly to Paul Little, the president uh, of the college, Doug Barnes, who is the chair of applied arts programs here, and through his generosity we've been able to uh, put this program on, and the Nova Scotia Community College for letting us be here and the facilities uh, committee to uh, Mitch Shea and Fatin El Shazi from our, from our group for the work that they have done and to Ashley and Cuddy who we have sent them for putting all of the pieces together. So Anne, it's up to you. So first of all, uh, I'd like to say thank you to our wonderful panelists. I think, you know, you each brought a perspective that was very unique. Um, and then that that goes even more for the wonderful and perceptive uh, questions that were asked and the comments that were made. And I think everyone, even our colleagues on the stage, learned a lot from hearing about you. Um, as the mother of a hip hop artist, uh, a spoken word artist, uh, I've had to really redefine what art is to me and I've always been interested in arts, the arts. Um, and uh, my son has taught me an awful lot about uh, uh, how broad the concept of art or creativity is. And um, I'm delighted to say that he uses that skill and works in schools to help kids verbalize uh, the things that they're feeling, etc. So I think that's some kind of therapy, but I don't know what you call it. <laughs> um, I wanted also to tell you that I'm very proud that the IWK is 
an institution that is very focused on the arts and artistic expression and creativity. And if you've been there, you will notice that all across our environment, um, we have paid special attention to what's on the walls and even what's on the ceilings because when kids or moms are laboring, uh, you, you're looking up not sideways. So all of those things become very important and we've paid a lot of attention to that. We've invested in uh, art that is therapeutic or stimulating or whatever. The built environment as a form of art I think is also another critical piece. The colors we used, the design we used, the minister talked about the new mental health unit. That, the colors and a lot of concepts on that unit were designed by the kids, the patients, their families. And it has a wonderful, warm feeling uh, because of that. We also have Buddington the Clown. And uh, we refer to him as the therapeutic clown. Now, we might have to rethink that. <laughs> but <laughs> he, he is the gra a graduate of a therapeutic clowning school, just like the folks here today are graduates of very specific programs in what we used to call art therapy and all of that. Actually, I think all of those programs are critically important. And I think, I believe in connectedness and integration. I think that's really important. But you folks have a particular skill set that you've learned in your professional education that is absolutely valuable. And you've been kind of locked out of our formal systems uh, over the last number of years. And I think we need to change that. Uh, we have a grand piano in our atrium and all kinds of other things at the IWK. So I think we're a pretty good example. The other thing we did in our recent renovations is we set aside 1% of our $50 million budget for arts and creative uh, whatever that will come down the road. And I think that we don't pay enough attention to how we create our environments in the healthcare setting. We build the building and the structures and all the places for the machinery and equipment, but I'm not sure that we do a good enough job in making those healing places with the kind of art creativeness that we, we could. Uh, so I think that's a challenge for all of us who work, work in, the health, in the healthcare setting, which just happens to be my experience. So I think, uh, the only other thing I want to say, because I take every opportunity and I torture the minister about this, this has got to start at conception. Uh, we can't wait until school to start talking about art, about creativity with kids. Uh, we know now that even in utero, there are important kinds of stimulation that will set the stage. We know that if you read to babies, sing to babies, have different kinds of movement activities for babies, um, that their chances of leading a full productive life are much greater than babies who don't have those experiences. And we know that in the first three years of life, that kind of creativity and that kind of exposure actually sets the stage for what future chronic illnesses will be, both mental and physical. So, it's really important to start thinking about this very, very early on in life and not wait, although it's important in school, but not wait until then for the kids' first exposure to creativity in the arts. So I'll stop there. Again, wonderful thanks to the panel. It's very interesting. And I have to say, you have the most amazing socks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are those a pair or not? Because <laughs> they're different. And I thought they were kind of Mondrian-like um, in their expression. So I think you really contributed, maybe inadvertently, to the, the creative discussions here today. Anyway, thank you to the whole panel.